Book 2, Chapter 6, Sir Gawain and the Lady Ragnall One of the strangest adventures of any that befell during the reign of King Arthur began on the Christmas day when the king and a number of his knights were holding their feast at the castle of Carlisle. Not long before this, Arthur and his knights had fought a great battle against the Saxons far up in the northeast of Scotland and driven them out of the whole island of Britain, and it seemed at last that the realm of Logris was firmly established throughout all the country. Southwards marched the armies once more. King Arthur has had a chosen band of his best knights following more slowly, and Christmas overtook them before they were well out of Scotland. So to Carlisle they came, and the great feast was set. But the banquet was scarcely begun when there came into the hall a fair damsel weeping and wringing her hands. King Arthur, she cried, my lord King Arthur, grant me a boon, I beg of you. The brave knight, my husband, has been overcome and carried away by the wicked master of Hewen Castle. It is a terrible place, that castle, rising darkly on a black rock high over the deep lake of Tern Waithlin. And there the dreadful master of the castle lies in wait for unwary travellers, carries them off to his stronghold, robs them, holds them into ransom, or casts them from the walls into the deep waters of the lake. It was but yesterday that, as my lord and I rode deep in the forest of Inglewood, the dread knight of Tern Waithlin came suddenly upon us. My husband he smote from his horse and carried him away bound, after he had sorely misused me. You may all see the cruel marks of his whiplash across my face. As the knight of Tern Wethlin rode away, I cried after him that good King Arthur would come swiftly and avenge the wrong that had been done me. But he laughed evilly and shouted, Tell yonder cowardly king that he may find me when he will at Tern Wethlin, but indeed I know well that he will never dare to stand against me. So I have come swiftly to you, most noble King Arthur. For if any man in this world dare stand against him, it is you. Now, by my faith as a knight, cried King Arthur, this adventure will dare myself. Will I dare myself? It is long since I rode out alone in quest of adventures, but this knight of Tern Waithlin shall fall beneath no spear but mine. Let me go rather, my lord, said Sir Gawain. Maybe some evil shall befall whoever rise to the haunted castle of Tan Waithlin, and without you the realm of Logres cannot endure. I thank you, good nephew, for your love, said King Arthur gently, for he loved Gawain better than any of his knights. But this time I will not be turned from following a quest myself. Bring me now my sword Excalibur and my spear Ron, and bid my squires saddle my horse with all the speed they may. Then, though Gawain and Lancelot, Geraint and <clears throat> Gareth, Gareth sought to persuade him to let one of them undertake the adventure, even Sir Kay offering himself as a champion, King Arthur rode away from Carlisle with the damsel and was soon lost to sight in the dark forest of Inglewood. Many and many a mile they went until, just as the sun began to sink towards the great hills and mountains of Cumberland, they came out of the forest onto the shores of a dark lake with black angry rocks going sheer down into it on every side, and saw a grim, forbidding castle set on an island a little way from the shore. This is the ta Tern Waithlin, said the damsel, and see, here comes the loathly knight himself. King Arthur looked where she pointed and saw the great drawbridge of the castle sink slowly until it rested on a rim of rock where the road ended on the shore. And sitting on a great horse in the castle entrance was the most terrible man he had ever seen. And the largest, almost a giant he seemed, with the <clears throat> long arms and his huge face. Aha! roared the knight of Tern Waithlin. Is that Arthur, the muling monarch of miserable Logris? Long have I wished to meet you. Welcome to the castle of Tan Waithlin. I am Gromer Somerjur, and I defy you, coward king. Then Arthur was so angry that he waited for nothing, nor did he pause to think how strange were all things that were happening that day, nor to see the wicked smile which came suddenly to the lips of the damsel. He set his spear in rest, the mighty spear which none might withstand, and rode at the knight as hard as he could go. 
Down the road he went over the ledge of rock and on to the long drawbridge, and then suddenly his horse stopped dead, neighing in terror, and his own arms sank powerless to his sides while a fear came over him so great that it was not of this world. Grommer Sommerjour, shouted the knight, and he laughed until the hills echoed his voice and the carrion crows flew screeching from the towers of the castle of Tern Waithlin. Grommer Sommerjour has conquered. No man may withstand the terror of him. This is the devil's work, gasped Arthur, the very hair of his head rising with the fear that could not with he could not withstand. It is the castle of my mistress, the Queen Morgana le Fay, said the damsel, riding up and mocking at Arthur with cruel hard words. Have pity, said Arthur. I will grant whatsoever you may desire. Pity will I have, pity will I have, boomed Grommer Sommerjour, the knight of Tern Waithlin. Go hence now for a year and a day, but first give me your royal word as a king and a knight of the round table that you will return and return alone, and I will set you this quest. Go where you will, and ask of all you meet what thing it is that women most desire in this world. What is it I know well? What it is I know well, and if you can tell me truly a year hence, you shall go free, I swear, and I am a true knight, whoever I may serve at this time. But if you find not the true answer, then I will slay you here upon this magic bridge and cast your body into the dark waters of Tern Waithlin. Go. He waved his arms as he spoke, uttering the last word in a great roar, and, king, and the king's horse spun round almost on its hind legs and bolted up the rocky road into the forest in a mad gallop of terror. Nor could King Arthur rein it in for many a long mile. Before the moon rose, he came to Carlisle, and there Sir Gawain met him and heard all the adventure. "'I scarcely know what to do,' said King Arthur. "'My sister plots my death with a new and terrible power, and I know not how to withstand it. "'Surely this is the last stroke against the might of Logris,' said Gawain. "'If we can defeat the evil this once more, it shall not again come against us clothed in evil magic.' One thing I know, said King Arthur, I must keep mine oath and return to this knight of Tern Waithland a year hence, and in the meantime I will seek for an answer to his riddle. And I will seek also, said Sir Gawain. A year had gone by when King Arthur and Sir Gawain rode once more through the forest of Inglewood to speak with Sir Gomer Somerjur. Sadly, they went on their way, for though Arthur carried with him two books filled with the answers which he and Gawain had collected from all over the country, he felt sure that none of them would satisfy the knight of Tern Waithlin. Not far from the end of their journey, they came out of the thick woodland across a bare upland moor and marsh, and there they met suddenly with a lady dressed in fine clothes and riding a great white horse. Her garments were of the richest, and many a jewel sparkled and shone about her. But as Gawain looked at her, he turned pale, and King Arthur crossed himself as if in the presence of something uncanny. For she was the loathliest woman that ever the eye of man rested upon. Her face was as red as the sinking sun, and long yellow teeth showed beneath wide, weak lips. Her head was set upon a great thick neck, and her, she herself was fat and unshapely as a barrel. Yet the horror of her seemed to lie in something more than the hideousness of her looks, for in her great squinting red-rimmed eyes there lurked a strange and terrifying shadow of fear and suffering. All hail, King Arthur! she cried in a shrill, cracked voice. Speak to me nicely now, for your very life depends upon it. Lady, said King Arthur gravely, I give you greetings, nor should my greetings change were you the greatest lady or the meanest lass in the land. I thank you, the lady replied. Now listen well. I know upon what errand you ride, and of the riddle that you must answer this day or die, and the answers you have already found are not worth a louse. She laughed her crackling screech at this, and then suddenly serious she went on. The true answer I can tell you, and tell you I will, upon one condition. What is your will, lady? asked King Arthur as he paused. Your word is a king and a knight of Logris, 
then a knight of yours, as nobly born as you, shall be my husband this day. That I cannot promise, said Arthur, looking her in the face and turning aside, sick with horror, try though he might to keep his face composed. Then you ride to your death, chuckled the loathly lady, her eyes a little darker with pain than before. Stay, cried Sir Gawain suddenly. I am King Arthur's nephew and a knight of the round table. If I take you as my wife, will you tell the answer to Sir Gromer Somer Jour's riddle? Oh, yes, indeed, Sir Gawain, surely, and indeed I will, she answered. She made answer eagerly. Bethink you what you do, exclaimed King Arthur. This is too great a sacrifice to make. Yet will I make it, Lord King of Logris, said Sir Gawain quietly. Lady, I pledge you my knightly word to take you in lawful marriage if you will save the life of my uncle King Arthur. Ride on then to Tern Waithlin, said the lady, and when you return I shall be waiting for you here, and we will return together to Carlisle. Then she came beside King Arthur and told him the answer to the riddle. A little while after this Arthur came once more to the dark Tern of Waithlin and the evil knight of the castle, but Sir Gawain tarried on the edge of the forest, and there, sitting his great horse as before, was Sir Gromer Somerjour. Greetings, King Arthur, he cried. You are a brave man to keep your tryst so well. Come now, tell me the answer to my question. What do women desire most in the world? For if you reply rightly, I swear that you shall suffer no harm from me. Then King Arthur opened the two books and read from them the many answers he had collected, but at the end Sir Gromer Somerjour laughed till the hills echoed round the dark tarn. You are but a dead man, King Arthur, he cried. Pomp, state, fine clothes, mirth, love, luxury, idleness, and the rest of the nonsense you have been reading me. None is the true answer. Come now, bow down your head, that I may strike it from your shoulders and carry it to my lady, Queen Morgana le Fay. Tarry a little, said King Arthur. As I came on my way, I met a loathly lady on the moor, and she told me that what women most desire is to rule over men, yea, even over the greatest. Then the knight of Tern Waithland swore a terrible oath. It is that accursed witch, the Lady Ragnall, he cried. She has betrayed us, <clears throat> thinking to escape, but escape she never shall. Go your ways, King Arthur, for you are safe from me, and if I ever may free myself from the rule of Queen Morgan le Fay, maybe you will find a place for me at your court. I am a rough fellow and rude of speech, but true to mine oaths. "'faithful to my lords and a mighty fighter. "'Come when you will,' said King Arthur. "'The realm of Logarus is wide enough "'for any who would serve it truly and with a pure heart.' "'But Sir Groma Somajur had swung around his horse, "'and with a cry, as of one in pain, "'he galloped across the drawbridge "'and into the Hewen castle of the dark waves of Tern Waithlin. "'And behind him the portcullis clanged down "'and the drawbridge swung screeching to its place, like a tomb closing upon some evil ghost of the night. Slowly King Arthur rode back the way he had come and found Sir Gawain waiting for him at the edge of the forest, rejoicing to see him return safely from his terrible adventure. To me the joy of one freed from death, said King Arthur, sadly, but to you I fear the sorrow of an evil that only death can cure. Back they rode through the forest, and upon the bleak moorland found the loathly Lady Ragnall waiting them. "'I have saved you, King Arthur,' she cried in her shrill, cracked voice. "'And now the gallant Gawain shall be my husband. Ride before us to Carlisle, Lord King, so that you may bid welcome with due honour to the bravest knight of Logris and his bride.' Sadly, King Arthur set spurs to his horse and hastened through the forest of Inglewood till he came to Carlisle. There he gathered the knights and ladies of his court together, told them something of his adventures, and bade them prepare for a great wedding. That evening he and Queen Guinevere rode through the streets to the city gate with a noble following of knights and ladies, while all the people of Carlisle lined the way, ready to cheer the bride and bridegroom. They came to the gate and waited there a while until they saw Sir Gawain come riding slowly along the high road from the forest with a lady upon a white horse beside him. They came to see that she was clad in rich garments and that the setting sun flashed and reflected from many jewels 
and all those who were gathered to meet them began to cheer. But suddenly a hush fell upon them, and the cheers faded into groans and murmured into silence when they saw the hideous twisted face of the Lady Ragnall. The horror of her great squinting eyes and how she sat hunched on her horse like a great bale of straw. Sir Gawain presented her to the king and queen as if she had been the fairest lady in all the world, and she grinned and chuckled as Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram, Sir Gareth and Sir Geraint, and many another noble knight, came in turn to kiss her hand. But the words stuck in their throats when they would have wished Sir Gawain joy, and in silence that gay cavalcade rode up the street to the great minister. Minster, the same silence falling suddenly upon the watching crowds as the bride and bridegroom rode by. Without a falter in his voice, Sir Gawain took to wife the Lady Ragnall in the presence of all people before the high altar, and led her then to the place of honor in the hall of the castle where a great feast was made ready. But the mirth and gaiety were forced at that feast, all looked upon loathing, looked with loathing and horror upon this Lady Ragnall, as she sat by Gawain guzzling and slobbering over her food and wine, and not one of them but pitied Sir Gawain and marveled over the strange wedding. Early the feast broke up, and Gawain, his face pale and drawn with suffering, led his bride to the great shadowing, shadowy chamber in the castle keep, where the candles flickered on the embroidered hangings and the shadows fell darkly upon the rushes on the stone floor. When they were alone beside the great bedstead, carved and curtained and spread with fine linen, the Lady Ragnall said, her voice more hateful now, that it was thick with drink as well as harsh and cracked, Dear husband, beloved Lord Gawain, kiss me now, as a bridegroom should be should his bride. For now indeed we are husband and wife until death shall us part. She laughed a cackling laugh that choked into wheezy silence. Gawain drew near to her, his face paler still and his eyes glazed with agony. But he caught the deep agony behind her eyes, and the repulsive horror of her face grew pale and indistinct as he bent down and kissed her on the lips. Then he turned away with a cry of anguish and leant against the wall, with his face hidden in his arms and his shoulders, shaking with sobs that he could not keep down. Gawain, my dear Lord Gawain, said a voice behind him, a low, sweet voice, tremulous with love. Slowly he turned as if in a dream, and where the loathly Lady Ragnall had stood a moment before, he beheld the loveliest maid that ever his eyes had seen. Tall and slim, she stood there, her white arms held out towards him, the sweet face and the lovely eyes slight and shining with love for him. Lady? he gasped in wonder and bewilderment. Lady, who are you? Where is my wife Ragnall? I am the Lady Ragnall, and your wife, if you will have me, came the answer in the low, sweet voice that fell like a gentle wind of the deep night on his tortured mind. By your great love and your noble sacrifice you have loosed me from the evil enchantment that the wicked Queen Morgan le Fay had laid upon me and upon my brother, the brave knight Sir Gromer Somerjour. But still I am not altogether free, for only during twelve hours out of each twenty-four shall I be as you see me now. For during the other half of each day I must wear again the hideous form to which you were wedded. Choose now whether by day or by night I shall be fair, whether by night or by day I shall be foul. Gawain stood as one bewildered and amazed, and Ragnall went on. Bethink you now, my lord, if I am foul by day, what you must endure when I come into the court as your wife and am seen by all the knights and ladies of Logris. Bethink you also what you must endure if I am foul by night, when you and I are alone together when you come home weary after the long day and find the shrill-mouthed horror waiting to disturb your rest, choose now which it shall be. Lady, said Sir Gawain presently, standing before her with bowed head, in this matter the word rests not with me. Bethink you what you must endure by day when the knights and ladies eye you with loathing, draw away in horror, fall silent when you speak. Bethink you also what you must endure by night when I, who have seen you lovely by day, cannot, cannot overcome the loathing that will fill me when you draw near to me that form of horror, in that form of horror. With you is the greatest suffering, and you alone must choose 
which you are most able to bear. Oh, Gawain, Gawain, cried Ragnall, with a, and a moment later she was weeping in his arms. There was never knight in all the world so noble and so unselfish as you. By this your choice, to leave the choice to me, you have undone the enchantment forever. In the fair form in which you now see me shall I be yours by both day and night, until the hated hour comes wherein I must leave you. But we have many years of happiness before that parting, and well you deserve all the happiness this world can give you. On the morrow there was such joy in King Arthur's court as had never been seen there before. Nor was any honor too great that could be done to Sir Gawain and his lovely bride, the Lady Ragnall. For seven years they lived happily together, no couple more happily in all the world, wide realm of Logris. And then, on the appointed day, Ragnall went from Sir Gawain forever. Some say that she died, but others that she fled away into the deep forests of Wales, and there bore a son to Sir Gawain, who in time became one of the noblest of all the knights of the round table. But whether that son's name was Percival, the old tales do not tell us. Some call him simply the fair unknown, but his adventures were so like those of Percival that we may well believe that in a tale now lost this was indeed the name of the son of Sir Gawain and the Lady Ragnall. <laughs>